speak wait, 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 wait. Speaking of grimy things, you were talking about stuff that was like trending on Twitter what? before. Oh my god, what? The only thing that like allowed me to go to sleep a couple of nights ago. Did you see this? Is this good? Yes. Um Oh. Was it those penguins? No. Okay. Um it was hashtag release the butthole cut. What? Where a visual effects artist who worked on cats says that he was brought in about four min- yeah, four months before the end of it to patch up, because for whatever reason, the original cut of the film apparently just had, like, exposed skin under the tail. Right. That was just, like, it looked like a fucking butthole <laughs> for every cat. So now people are demanding that they release the butthole cat, a yeah, cut of cats. <laughs> release the butthole cat? <laughs> On that too, I guess. The extended, unrated butthole cat. Wow. What the fuck is wrong with these people? (laughs) (laughs) Can you imagine being like, what's that guy's name? That asshole's name who made the King's speech. Um, Tom Hooper or whatever. Can you imagine? Like, what the fuck is that guy's life? Where his (laughs) life is so miserable and empty that the only thing he has to do with his time (laughs) is to make cats. What a fucking asshole. Oh my God. I'm, I'm still devastated. I didn't get to see cats in the theaters. I really am. It's well, is he married? Who, like <laughs> who the fuck can interact with this person? Like in any way, listen, cats is like the highest grossing musical of all time. You can't, are like, you fucking with me right now? No, I'm not. <laughs> it's, it like it's made a bajillion dollars. I'm not fucking with you. Wow. It makes kind of sense for it to exist on in movie form, but well, Max, you know what else has made a bajillion dollars? Um, not the butthole cut yet because it hasn't been released. No, is there a butthole cut for this movie? I, I just all the ants had gigantic buttholes. I'm sure, we could find one, but no, Max, I was referring. To the Spectator Film Podcast. We haven't made any money. What are you talking about? <laughs> you owe me some extra checks there. <laughs> you know, it's we've had some like accounting issues in our different departments uh, with, you know, invoices going back and forth. But we're going to figure it out right now. Uh, we're in the red. But, you know, we've made lots of money, really. It's just a very, very expensive production. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Our, yeah. our studio here is very elaborate. Yeah, it's it's great. Uh, we had to upgrade to the underground bunker. Not just for coronavirus, but literally all the things that have happened in 2020. Oh, Jesus Christ. What a, what a fucking year it's been. Yeah, sorry, everybody, that we've been a little bit on the quiet end, but we... we Max is back from paternity leave. Yes, um, I, I was pregnant for three months. It was <laughs> for a, three months, wow. Yeah. Um, was it just an ant? <laughs> hey, what a great way to lead in. <laughs> No, uh, we, we, I had some personal stuff, but, uh, thank you guys for ha- uh, hanging in there. Um, I, I did enjoy hearing from a couple of you and it, uh, it, it helped me get through it. Thank you. I appreciate that. But that's enough of that. Um, let's go fucking talk about gigantic ants in one of my, honestly, one of my favorite movies of all time, which, uh, um, oh, I don't think I knew. I knew you loved it. I didn't know if you, it was like literally one of your favorites. Well, okay. Here's the thing from a, like directing or cinematography or just like elements of film point of view absolutely not oh it's got some good stuff in there it does but it's not one of my favorite examples of that from a movie that has had nothing but a positive impact on my life and i have nothing but good memories with this movie will never leave um well that i i hope you manage to hold on to that once the giant ants actually invade us in 2020 because that's like on the list of terrible things that's that have like yet to but happen. that's like august we, we got a couple of months before that happens i don't even know time is accelerating we're gonna get through all these the rivers are gonna run red uh we're gonna get mummies and and draculas coming around and then the ants show up oh by the way which movie is it max um Oh, right. Them! Yes. Exclamation point and all. Them. 1954. Them. Oh, God. And your pick, obviously. Yes. Uh, Boy, oh, boy, do I love this movie. So, not to sound like a record player every time we do a horror or monster movie, but when I was a teenager, I started watching a bunch of horror films. But this was the one that I have the most memories of, of just ordering pizza, 
when I was like 14 or 15, hanging out with friends and watching late at night. This is like, I think this holds true for a lot of people, but for me, especially, this is like the epitome of the 1950s monster movie. It really does feel like it summarizes a lot about that atomic monster. You, movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have, you have a lot of, uh, science quote unquote. Um, no, Max, it's totally real. Th- that's the thing though. Like some of it is actually real. It's more than just like we fucking did this in the DNA and now it, the wolf is 80 feet tall. Um, dino DNA. At least like when the scientist character is rambling on for 80 years, like some of the stuff he says about ants is actually true. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> But you, you have a lot of science babble. You have a lot of gruff, manly men just being like, oh, we need to fucking kill these things. James Whitmore with his fucking eyebrows. Yeah. And you even have a woman. Um, What's her name, Max? What is anybody's name in this movie? <laughs> I to, don't know, to be honest with I've you. seen this movie eight million times, and I could not tell you a single character's name. But it because of that, it's just such a pure distillation of... 1950s movies and I know that like this isn't the first one it's not you can probably argue that it's not cinematically the best one but I I challenge you to find a pure example of a 1950s monster movie um I also might have mentioned on the podcast before the longest fucking papers I ever had to write for a film analysis class when I was back at Keene it's like 20 pages long so very, very long paper about uh, comparing this to Godzilla and film as an expression of countries uh, reacting to the nuclear bomb with Godzilla representing the fears of a country that had received it and them representing still being slightly cautious and fearful of it, but the country that had unleashed the nuclear bomb being like, no, the U S military, we got this. We can control it as long as we understand it. Right. And either way, there's still definitely an anxiety about both. Like that is the fundamental premise of both is like the bomb went off and then this happened. Um, and of course, coincidentally, both released in the same year. I, I did, tried to look it up though. And it's like, neither of them were influenced by one another. It just, this truly was, which for good reason, the bomb was on people's minds at this point in time in history. It's kind of hard to ignore. Um, it hadn't even been a decade since we used them. So like, yeah. yeah. And you know, obviously at the beginning of the fifties, you have the cold war really starting to get into full gear. And, uh, I feel like, you know, that alone is going to provide as at least as much anxiety as the fact that it was already used once is the fact yeah. that now two countries that don't like each other both have one. That's like the worst case scenario. So totally makes sense that multiple different people in different areas. Um, and then America and Japan specifically, you know, two countries that will be forever linked in this very specific way is, as being the only two countries that have, have either been had the nuclear dr- bomb dropped on them or used one. Right. Yes. So it totally makes sense that you would have Godzilla and then a movie like this coming out around the same time. And Godzilla Definitely contributed more to film overall, I would say. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, Godzilla is just... I love him. But still, I, I maintain to this day, if I could, like, time travel and choose any one movie prop to just, like, permanently have, it would be one of the giant ant puppets from this movie. Just Not David David uh, Bowie's cod piece from, from um, Labyrinth? I said keep, not just sniff. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> Oh my God. I bet it smells to this day. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's deeply guarded in a Muppet vault. You can do you think they like, <laughs> they like hammered that into like Bowie's like mausoleum in his tomb. It's just the cod piece sticking out. <laughs> that's what's in the middle of the dark crystal. He oh. looks like <laughs> <laughs> that's what gives the Skeksis their power. Oh my God. <laughs> oh. At least the butthole cut. <laughs> Hashtag release the butthole <laughs> cut. Crystal. But anyway, Austin. Anyway, back to the ants. Um, back to the ants. What's what's your history with this movie? Uh, yeah, this is definitely one of those movies that, like you said, it seems to epitomize a certain type of 50s monster movie. Um, and I know one of the things we always talk about with a horror genre, especially because it's such a varied genre and it can be made for so cheap that lots of people make movies in different ways 
subgenres and cycles that actually are surprisingly different from one another. So when we say 50s monster movie, there's lots of variants within that. However, this one is totally one that captures the spirit of the time, I feel, and definitely seems to capitalize on a lot of the really fun things about this type of movie. And uh, I feel like it's something that I knew through cultural osmosis because of that, because it's just so perfect at what it does. Uh, much like an ant, just perfectly evolved uh, to accomplish all its goals, Max. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, it's it's something that I don't think I saw until maybe the last five years, but I can't really remember when. But part of that is because I, I just feel like I had the familiarity with it prior. It's one know? of those movies that like, you just look and you're just like, Oh, I understand this. Yeah. And there are a lot of movies that like when people tell me like, no, I haven't seen it, but I kind of get it. Yeah. I would be like, fuck you. No, watch the movie yeah. for them. I'm just like, no, you probably do. You kind of do. Yeah. But, but also it's also still watch good. it. It's fun. Yeah. I was going to add, I'm glad you bring that up because that's a good way to describe it. I feel like it's a movie that, uh, it has that specific quality that you were just talking about, but also that seems to, almost be at the movie's expense. Like it, it provides you with the ability to almost dismiss it or overlook the fact that it's actually fun. And there's a lot of neat craft stuff going on. And, uh, it's a kind of sophisticated movie in some ways and concerning its subtext. Um, and it is maybe a little bit easy to overlook that when it so perfectly captures the more, more like broad strokes of a fifties monster movie because you do watch it and it doesn't really throw you a ton of curveballs, but it's interesting. And, uh, it was really neat watching it for the show this week because it was like, there's so many conventional scenes from this type of monster movie or that have been appropriated, appropriated in different films. Uh, some of which we've covered on the show before, right? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot to like dive into with this movie. And I totally agree that it's just like one of those classic genre movies that even though it's not perfect, it, it's just so perfectly captures the idea of what it's going for that you can just kind of sit down and watch it. And it's kind of give, going to give your brain some like grist for the mill or something. And it's like, I don't know, it's just engaging. Um, I wish we still had the capability to make B movies. Yeah. Like this, because it's sort of, I don't know. It's just interesting to see how much a movie like this just like renders interesting ideas. For this was it. like, I think the second gro- highest grossing movie of the year that it came out. So. You know what the first one was? No, I do not. It's a movie we've done before. Um, fuck. I know this. It's going to probably be boss baby two. Oh no, that's incorrect. Uh, it is Creature from the Black Lagoon. Oh, okay. So we were just all about the B-movies that year. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and and there's some other fun information I, I sort of looked up about the whole torrent of similar movies that this movie spawned and how this movie maybe was inspired in its production uh, that I can bring up too related to that. But it's, I don't know, I just, I am also a really big fan of it. I didn't have that experience that you had growing up, but uh, I'm just, I'm really glad to be able to talk about it. And surprisingly topical well yeah and apparently uh because we're all gonna die of coronavirus drive-in theaters are making a big comeback in the places that have them because you don't have to get out of your car you know what the weirdest thing about this max is is that with all the sudden like capitalist changes happening in the past two weeks um which should we just clarify for like posterity because we have no idea what's going to happen we live in the u.s we live right outside new york uh it is it is full hysteria lockdown mode, or at not, least not quite yet, but we're getting there. Um, well, okay. The smart people it yeah. is. And then the old people and then the really young people are, they're like, Woo, we're on spring break. And then it's just a nightmare. We could have a whole podcast about that. People uh, point is this is going to fuck with the DNA of America forever. Now, <laughs> like this is going to be a c- country altering event, much like, a nuclear bomb might fuck with the DNA of, of an ant. Yeah. So, you know, like it's sort of something where you talk about drive-in theaters making a comeback. And it's like, they might be back more fucking long-term. I don't even know. I know, but I'm saying like it captures the mood of this movie. So yeah. And this is just a movie about the government trying to fight a giant disaster. So, you know, they're probably more effective at it than our government currently they is. They absolutely are. But with that, let's get going. All right. Are you ready? Beware of them. 
You're a fucking choir boy compared to me! A choir boy! Good old time in black and white. Yeah. I've mentioned this before, but... Oh, God, that, that logo is so great. I, that's one of my planned tattoos. It's just that... <laughs> Them? Just that tattoo, yeah. Are you going to get that, like, on your neck or something? No. I, probably. Eh, that pro- would be really confusing. No. I, I to would a ju- lot of people. I would just get it, like, a back tattoo, probably. Um, I think you should get it across your chest. A forehead tattoo. Um <laughs> Nah, because I think if it's, if it's across the chest, it's then like a big reveal. And you're like, wow, I didn't think you'd be somebody with a giant tattoo across your chest that said them exclamation point. Uh, but that that this movie has helped me out in a bunch of film history courses because that bit is the only bit of color in the movie. Because, um, yeah, 1954 is also the year that... Uh, color film became widely cheaper and a lot of movies started being released in color. Now you say that, and I've tried to look this up and maybe it's tied to a specific type of film stock, but I could not find verifying information on that max. However, I've gotten, I don't know, but (laughs) I've gotten a lot of questions right on tests because of it. So, but max, we all know that's because you sleep your way to the top. (laughs) Just like (laughs) all like the film history (laughs) professors I've had. Oh no. (laughs) Oh, <laughs> uh, we love you, film professors. We We're do. kidding. Max <laughs> literally loves you. Uh, it, <laughs> anyway, so um, so good to be back for all this time. <laughs> Here we have a uh, guy and dude, James Whitmore. Yes, or no? Is it James Whitmore? We don't know. We have James Whitmore and we have James Arness. Multiple Jameses. Uh, one has he has the biggest eyebrows. <laughs> Just too many eyebrows. <laughs> too many. <laughs> That's a different thing, Max. I'm talking about them just being too big. But no, James Whitmore, uh, multiple times uh, nominated, Oscar-nominated actor. Uh, unfortunately, nobody besides, I would say the doctor gives the best performance in this movie. Just, He's an Oscar-winning actor. Yeah. But to be fair, this movie isn't about the character performances for the most part. No, not really. But I do feel like that would make it more fun. That said, I feel like it definitely, um, it's definitely the type of movie that I think uh, helps pioneer in a genre sense those character archetypes that would then become more boring and more stock characters in other movies. You know what? I'm going to change my answer. This little girl, actually, for the 50s, and just like, little girl, acts traumatized and don't respond to anything. This little girl's the best actress in the movie. She became a big um, child actor. After this, I, there's a, I don't know if it's just like a sort of apocryphal story, but I believe Gordon Douglas, the director, the anecdote is that he just saw her eating in a diner and then wanted to cast her. And she's really quite kind she's, of like spellbinding. She's unsettling. Yeah. Right off the bat, which is good because another good part about this movie is it doesn't, it doesn't give you what you want immediately, which can be a blessing or a curse in these kind of movies. Because I've watched a lot of 50s uh, monster movies, and there's a lot of them where they don't show you the monster until the last act of the movie, and even then it's only partial, and then they light it on fire or blow it up with something, and then nothing happens, and you're like, why the fuck did I watch this movie? Or it's Roger Corman, and then the the monster has a thousand eyes, but it's invisible. Oh, what what movie was it? I, I got the monster with a thousand eyes. No. Or whatever. I, I'm think there's... This one movie, I forget what it was. I watched it with the same friend that we initially watched yeah, them with. But I got this, bit, you know, like those like a hundred movie packs. Yeah. I got one of those and I think it was supposed to be like they were irradiated weasels or something like that. Wow, that's pretty good. But they just like got a bunch of dogs and put like. <laughs> like they couldn't even get weasels no no because they were rated so they'd be bigger or something so they're irradiated with weasels that have been irradiated to look like dogs <laughs> no they're just like dogs that like they put like, like a, a hat on basically <laughs> like a like one of those springy antenna things it was the worst you gotta find that again i, I probably i'm thinking of like an antenna from like one of those lame bumblebee outfits it's kind of it's like that level yeah. of just like they let a bunch of dogs in the room. Oh, the dogs are that. just like, oh, I'm a dog. I'm here now. So by the way, weird coincidence. This child actor, right? Um, she was also in movies like Bad and the Beautiful and The Cobweb. 
Um, but also she was in a movie at or a TV adaptation, it looks like, of Miracle on 34th Street, oh. which, of course, the doctor in this movie, whatever the fuck that guy's name is, uh, what's his name? Edmund Gwen, that's his name. He, of course, won the Oscar for playing Santa Claus, St. Nick, in the famous 1947 version. Oh, okay. Yeah. It all comes around. Yeah, it all it does kind of all come around. But it, again, we should just finish our point. She's pretty good in this movie, and she, of course, also becomes a character archetype. As I'm sure many people have pointed out, James Cameron really utilizes the fuck out of the, the basic structure of this movie oh, God, in Aliens. Yeah. Um, and uh, already we're seeing some sort of more scene conventions that are similar. Uh, this is one of the interesting things that I really enjoyed sort of picking through mentally watching it this time around, which is how much scenes like this, these detection scenes sort of made me realize that there's a very specific type of detection scene in monster movies that is different from other forms of like inspection and detection from the male protagonist inspector. Um, that are related to just like witnessing carnage. Of course, they all come before you actually see the monster, right? So it's it's partially un, like building up stakes, right? But then of course it's also like fetishizing the absence of the monster by making its the evidence of its absence all the more dramatic. Yes. Um, and there are so many examples of it, like we were talking about during the uh, preparation screening, it, it, movies from like Tremors, yes. uh, The Thing has a great scene like that. Um, Aliens, of course, yeah. very much has a scene like this. Aliens to a, like furthering my dislike of James Cameron degree is just like a lot of this movie. Yeah. It's, it's more of an action movie than this movie is by far. Right. But God, if the basic plot structure isn't the same. Yeah. I mean, the idea of the queen is basically taken from this movie. 100%. Yeah. Like, and and I, we're going to see it later with the egg chambers and everything. It is interesting to see the lineage of that movie sort of develop, right? Um, but it, it again, that I think that's a testament to the strength of like the conventions and tropes that were marshaled within this movie and just unified, right? Because it's like this movie brought them all together and even 30 plus years later when James Cameron makes a much more contemporary feeling like action movie that has totally different atmosphere and is going for something completely different. It still works to use the same structure and borrow scenes from this because it so perfectly crystallizes these different tropes in a specific way. I'm just thinking, cause that cop's going to die soon. <laughs> I'm just thinking of just him yelling game over, man, game over. Basically in the 1950s movie. We should go back and re-edit that into all these other movies that use the Wilhelm scream. This does. Oh, this is one of the first theatrical uses of the Wilhelm scream, actually. Oh, yeah. It uses it multiple times. Um, well, which, maybe like, what, three years after it was made? I think so. I, I don't care about the Wilhelm scream. I, I don't know much about it. I, I think I think it's fun just because, like, it's such a ridiculous sound effect that you see so often. But no, not now, though. Not at this point, but I don't know. It's fun. I mean, I don't hold it against this movie, but if a movie that came out now used it, I'd be like, what are you doing? You know, it's not clever. You have, to, so, yeah. you have to be a certain type of movie now to get away with it. You can't just like. You'd have to use it in a very specific way. Yes. Like one of the more recent movies we've done on the show, um, which it's not like I really enjoyed its use in that one. But when it was used in Hellboy, it was used when a German soldier got like thrown into like a fire or something. And you're like, oh, it's like because it's Wilhelm. The German soldier. Oh, can we pause? Oh, for the magical noise. This. So I know Godzilla has an iconic roar. Yes. And Godzilla's roar is second to none. However, Godzilla's roar gets either reused or revamped in every movie ever, like every Godzilla movie ever. The sound of the chirping noise from them does not get used nearly enough. It does get used in the Misfits song which I love, but we need to appreciate that. What a great, great monster sound effect. Cause like, how do you like have this foreboding thing for ants, which don't fucking make noise. It's just like, yeah, they have antenna. Maybe they make that noise when they're big, whatever. I don't know, but it, it works so well and I love it so much. Yeah. It's, it's a really, 
it really helps sell everything. And again, it's just the classic horror movie move of you're going to, you know, hint at the thing, the monster using off screen sound. This movie, we talked about it during the prep screening is really focused, especially in this first part on utilizing horror aesthetics in order to tell its story where it is very much about closely inspecting the damage that has been done by the monster, but then also it's low key lighting and, um, you know, uh, especially in this setting with this windy like hut over here that they're also going to discover has been trashed and destroyed. You have these lights swinging back and forth and it's like, that's a horror movie aesthetic, right? You're creating this weird, vaguely expressionistic looking space, you know, like for a corporate made film in the fifties, like this is, it's very interesting. They did, they did get like a lot of, um, neat stuff in this movie. And I should point out also, oh my gosh, the, uh, the cinematographer for this movie is Sidney Hickox, who has worked on a ton of fantastic movies. Uh, I think he's cinematographer. Let me look it up on letterboxd 81 films. He's cinematographer for here are some of the famous ones. Okay. So he, obviously he did this, but then he also did the big sleep to have and have not white heat, dark passage dames, the uh, Busby Busby Berkeley movie, um, so that that's like straight up. That's like five, or no, I'm sorry, that's like four pretty big uh, noir yeah. movies, right? So noir is obviously very famous for its chiaroscuro lighting, um, and you know the aesthetic touches that it sort of takes from expressionism. And I think this definitely well, incorporates those this techniques. Is sti- this is still a detective part, so it makes yeah. sense to use noir esque lighting, but. And I really do enjoy this part of the movie, especially before they get into the boardroom stuff. We're going to talk about that too when that happens. But this stuff is just like something about the way it's shot and the way they're doing it. It's just like it is very engaging to just sit back and watch these people, you know, move through these spaces that are lit interestingly and then try to like uncover clues and find the objects that tell the story of what happened. And again, when they find the body here in the cellar, I do think it's like a pretty effective cut, right? Oh, no. With the reveal yeah. coming from the swinging light. That it is a little bit more graphic than you expect. Especially, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Because well, 50s, all deaths happen off screen or bloodlessly. And so like, or both. Now, Max, I saw a woman getting eaten by an ant at the poster. Well, so that's not true what you just said. The poster lied to you. No, that does not happen. It's not like we did Island of Lost Souls. Where, Max, that's illegal. Where they're just like, oh, the panther woman is going to lure you to the island. She and did. Consume you. She totally did, Max. She did none of those things. She did. The panther woman was a victim. <laughs> um, oh, God, the sugar, Max. The, l- listen, folks, this is why you don't leave your sugar out. Uh, you're going to get these giant ass ants coming for you. Well, my problem with this is that the ants are attacking places with sugar. Cool. Whatever. That's, that's their ant senses. They're leaving all of it behind. They're fucking shitty giant. ants. Yeah. Also, why did they have all the sugar? What? Why? Why do they have it? It's a general store. So they just have barrels and barrels of sugar. That's just had how I guess it's in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. It's in the middle of the desert in the fifties. You just have sugar. Do you think they service like the old couple from courage, the cowardly dog? Yes. (laughs) I love that. That creepy stuff happens in nowhere. (laughs) So speaking of, uh, other movies that utilize this trope of discovering destroyed places and detecting them, uh, which also we can throw on the list. Some other movies we've covered stuff like pitch black, Creature from the Black Lagoon as well has it where they discover the destroyed camp. Don't you dare bring Pitch Black into this, but... Aesthetically, this right now is kind of similar to Pitch Black. What are you talking about? I don't have a headache, but... No, they're on a desert planet. (laughs) And the movie's not orange. Riddick is running around. (laughs) Vin Diesel shows up in them. He's going, come on! And then what's the other thing he says in that movie? But we're getting this, our first death in the movie. Yeah, look at this great horror lighting. Um, and I guess the other interesting thing, I, I think it's neat to compare this movie to, and this type of detection scene specifically, Max, to some other movies we've talked about, um, specifically the Hammer Horror movies. And we talk a lot in those episodes about how 
the male f- authority figures in those films very much utilize their like detecting prowess as like this weird sublimation of like sexual agency and like subjective agency, right? Their ability to detect what's going on in a situation and the agency that represents is like a big part of their male identity and their agency. So uh, I think it's interesting when you compare those detection scenes to these because scenes like this in this movie and the movies this movie inspired, um, they seem to have a different goal in mind when they're investigating these, this, this like destruction, right? Where it's like, there is no possible answer is the thing. Right. Yeah. So it's always about creating a situation where like suddenly their identity as men is thrown into crisis because they cannot adequately detect what is going on. Right. And while I don't think this movie is entirely focused on that, we will see later that uh, gender is going to become a subtextual element in this film, especially with the what's her face woman. Yeah. Woman doctor. Well, it's going to be, I think her name is Pat. It's going to become textual, honestly, because you have woman doctor. Yeah, it's doctor, not very. You have woman doctor and you have mom who's. Mom? Yeah. Who's mom? The mother at the end of the movie who's just like, they they have a military operation. Mother. Sorry. Um, they have a military operation that they derail because they don't want to make this mom cry anymore because <laughs> the ants might eat her two little boys. Yeah, that, that's, that's another thing. But I feel like with Pat specifically, it's yeah. going to become. If we're talking about like the crisis of male identity in this, because they, I can't put the clues together, right? It's, it's more related to Pat and part of their ability to sort of um, move forward and adequately address this crisis, Max, is to actually accept the help of a woman. Yes. I mean, God this damn mo- it, they've this got mo- to do it. This movie doesn't fully it, yeah, embrace that. No. It's mainly the woman like translating her bumbling fa. <laughs> Other's genius in a way that these numbskulls can understand it. I mean, I, I want to be fair to it. I think we both definitely agree that the politics of this movie are, they seem to lean conservative, well, even though I think it's a fifties. Like, yeah, if you look at the time, but well, that's a whole other conversation that we yeah. should have. But I think if you look at the criticism of this movie and just the scholarly conversation around it, a lot of it seemed to look at this movie as a more conservative Uh, version of this 1950s monster movie. However, I do want to point out that still you do get this instance of the Pat character who does have scenes where she advocates for herself, even if if it's in this very limited way. It's not quite as black and white as it might be made out to be. However, I think we both feel that maybe she's positioned in that way and then doesn't really get an opportunity to lead, but then also just becomes... She's on the front line later, and then it's just another opportunity for the men to save her. You know? Um, and she also kind of just disappears Yeah, very later on in the movie. But you're only allowed to have one woman on screen <laughs> at any given time anymore, and the movie might explode. Yeah. But I do think it's an interesting conversation to lead into um, as far as that's concerned and how it relates to the sort of clashing gender here where the, ma- the male cannot address the ant problem, so they have to accept a more <laughs> feminine identity. Um which could be represented by her father as well because he's kind of kooky. You know, he's not, he's not like a traditional patriarchal figure. No, you he's know? like a Ooh. He's not Professor Meister from the Gorgon, <laughs> although I would also love to see that movie. <laughs> what if Christopher Lee just showed up in this movie? He just shows up and he's like, it's ants, clearly. <laughs> you have to beat the shit out of some ants. Yes. Have you ever heard of ants? <laughs> yes. The le- Greek legend of ants. <laughs> Oh, great. I love the Gorgon. I think that character, Professor Meister, should be in every movie. <laughs> I'd be so fine when, like... You know uh, what, Max? I'm just going to say, I think Schindler's List would have had a much happier ending. <laughs> if it was so many Professor movies. Meister. <laughs> just Christopher Lee shows up at some point to, like, set everybody straight and is like, no, you're God being damn a it. fucking idiot. Oh, man. Uh, that's so that movie is so much fun but also we just talked over the entrance of james arness oh no that tall man he's an incredibly thick individual max you do you man you <laughs> but seriously he's so fucking tall uh <laughs> like in the scenes where he's talking to james whitmore it's I like, like you know what thick means <laughs> austin i really don't oh no i do i just said it because i thought it was funny look how tall he is 
You know what else is funny that I learned, though, is that James Whitmore was actually wearing lifts in their scenes together so he could actually be closer to his height. I don't think James Arness could fit in that plane. Just thinking of him wearing like eight inch high heels. <laughs> you just see him like crumble under his own weight suddenly. Cuts to like him on the ground. His legs are like in a pretzel. Oh, speaking of legs, Max. <laughs> Austin, I need to. I said that prematurely. I didn't mean uh, <laughs> St. <laughs> Nicholas legs. <laughs> douse you with water. <laughs> Call him fucking FBI man thick. Edmund You're Gwen. Santa Claus. <laughs> Out for his legs. I, I said that prematurely, folks. <laughs> I mean, hey, I got nothing against Santa legs. He, he, he knew exactly what he was doing. Don't let him fool you. Now here are the real legs. And again, the movie, you're right when you say that it's barely tech, like subtext. I mean, they just... Oh, boy. Look at the lady. <laughs> She's, like, introduced... The first thing about her is, like, her heels. <laughs> That's, like, her defining leading characteristic. Oh my god. I love the idea of James Arnest just being so fucking tall that they constantly have to like compensate just to make him look normal or make other people look like a normal height compared to him. Can you imagine this being like a Lord of the Rings esque like undertaking just because he's way too fucking <laughs> tall? Suddenly they're using like forced perspective and they're actually like standing really far apart from one another. Well, wasn't it in like the hobbits that like all the dwarves were like so much taller than every the other actors, so it was just like annoying as shit. What if that was like the case for Santa Claus over there where it was just like he was eight feet tall and they had to keep filling in force perspective to. Well, I mean, that is the case for fucking James Arness. He's like eight feet. No, I think he's like seven one for real though. Or maybe he's like seven six. Or maybe he's just like five eleven. This is he's not five eleven, Max. This is the 1950s. People were shorter back then, Austin. But That's not true. <laughs> It looks like he was getting frustrated with me. James Whitmore? Yeah. I, I just, I noticed that watching this time too, like he's kind of just funny to look at because he looks so judgmental. He's not even like really expressing. It's just his eyebrows are so fucking large. Like he looks like his eyebrows are going to transform into a bat and then fly away. <laughs> It does look just like a lazy artist seagull. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a spy plane for the Soviet Union. Oh, here's the great scene where uh, Santa Claus is going to tra traumatize the child yeah. with like hypnosis or something. With acid. <laughs> Thank you very much. With acid. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's going to make her sniff the acid. Not a good idea. Listen, if you want to get a rise out of your kid, don't like pour acid into a shot glass and then just like wave it in their face. <laughs> what Austin is trying to say is don't give your kids acid. You know what? Don't have kids. Yeah. That's the real thing. <laughs> so one thing uh, I've been meaning to bring up in this movie that I find really interesting is the, uh, the sort of contrast between technology and nature that we see opening up in the very first sequence. We get those great shots of the airplane flying around, but they're sort of, um, I think they're like framed by a Joshua tree out in the desert, right? It's very nice nature shots. It's kind of like an abstract, frightening space, uh, nature in this movie. And I think it's interesting if you use that as, as a like starting oh. point to really discuss like the way this movie subtextually is trying to examine the us versus that. them, you know? Because uh, one of the things that a lot of people might talk about with this movie is pulling the classic genre analysis trick, especially with these 50 sci-fi movies of looking at the monster as a metaphor for this, that, or the other thing. Right. And, uh, while I think sometimes you can make compelling arguments for that, I think, uh, some of the arguments that have usually been made, uh, on behalf of this movie and potential me metaphors therein, uh, lack a little bit of cohesion sometimes, specifically the Soviet Union 
comparison, even though I understand why some people might think that the idea that this movie is subtextually about, you know, some type of anxiety over fighting a, a system of faceless, uh, drones that are all working for a collective. Yeah. Who have no individuality whatsoever. They were no threat before the nuclear age, like that kind of thing. Um, but now they're determined and they're, they're ideological max. Even if you destroy one, they're going to split up and make more. They're self-replicating like a, a domino like Skynet. Effect. Yeah. It's kind of like Skynet in a weird way. Right? You keep referencing Terminator today and like... What? I, when did I re- reference it before, sir? T-1000 before the show. Oh, I, yeah. That was another bad metaphor. <laughs> no, I just... I've seen each Terminator movie once, so I don't remember them do you remember that scene in t3 when he goes into the gay bar at the beginning and then he punches the guy dressed up as elton john and he gets the elton john sunglasses no you could have made up that entire thing and i would have been like yeah sure whatever that actually happened sure whatever you say Can oh, here's st- the first argument of James Arness yelling at her for can being you stop, a woman. Can you stop being a woman and can your father stop using big, complicated words that I don't understand? Oh, you know what else is a fun fact about this, just production-wise, is that uh, apparently they <laughs> they wheeled in a lot of like dump trucks of specific types of sand to this area so they could blow it in their face better. <laughs> I guess because they like the sand that was there was like, this isn't good sand for this. We need to blow it in their face. So they had like a bunch of dump trucks of sand that they just dumped in this area. Ugh. Also, I can buy gigantic radioactive ants in this movie. That's fine. But the fact that that footprint is still there when the wind is going this fast. I mean, that's the footprint is always the funniest thing yeah. in this movie as far as the evidence goes, because it's like ants don't have feet. I mean, they do, but also but like, like they don't leave footprints. Like if you, if you want to do that and like, you're going to be like, oh, but there's one over here of an equal distance and another one over here. Huh? That ratio is consistent with my The thing is there's an imprint in the sand and it's like, it'd just be like sticking a giant straw in the sand. Yeah, basically. Yeah. It won't leave a footprint. No, but like I, I can see of just doing like, oh, so we have one over here, one over here, one over here, and we get six of them in this area. So it's an ant. Okay, cool. They're just like, oh, it's definitely an ant. Yeah. Oh, look, she found another one. (laughs) Oh, God, here they come, Max. We're going to get the introduction. The reveal. It is a pretty good reveal. Sorry. Where are they? Where are they, Max? Sorry. I can't see them. Even after seeing this movie 80, hundred times, I'm still just like, no, I don't want to. I want to see it. I want to see it. You know what I just noticed, too, is that it looks like James Arness's suit is too big for him. How's that possible? <laughs> they made it for gorillas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at it. Look at it. I love it. Oh, man. I would I wanna, love. I want to hug it. I would love to get a bunch of gorillas in suits. <laughs> That'd be so cute. Oh, my God. I want to hug it so badly. Don't like, I'm not insane here. Don't you want to get like close to that and just like see how it works and just like, well, I can tell you a little bit about how it works. They had people inside operating them. Well, obviously I'm saying just like, isn't that the kind of stuff that you want to see up close though? Just the practical effects and the puppetry and the, uh, yeah, it's great. That's the stuff that drives me wild. With it's great. Movies. I mean, I understand if people say like it's dated, but one thing we always talk about with these movies is like, it's not quite the like verisimilitudinous or whatever the word would be. I guess it, it like, it's not the fact of the prop or the special effect um, resembling or being exactly true to life in a way that it, it can, you can describe as having verisimilitude. It's like, is it, does it true look- to the aesthetic of the movie? Yes. Can you buy it? It does not a matter of if you saw this in real life, do you think, like, would it's you be real. like, oh my God, there's a giant ant right there? Or 
when you're watching this movie in the context of the movie, are you like, oh, that's a giant ant? I understand its story yeah. purpose. And the more more specifically than that, the aesthetic context of the yes. movie. And that's again just going back to the one of the things we really have been praising this movie for is that it really helped to like unify this fifties monster movie aesthetic. So I feel like the ants just like work perfectly in this. It just lines up really well. So yeah, I think I was saying, talking about the uh, Soviet union comparisons in the metaphor earlier. And, um, I think one of the interesting things in talking about that too, is the degree to which I feel like this is a much more ambiguous movie rather than just being specifically about the Soviet union. And, uh, I have one really solid book, um, that I sort of lightly skimmed while preparing for this movie called rational fears, the, uh, American horror in the 1950s by Mark Jankovic, who's a uh, pretty solid writer. He also have, has a, uh, anthology I think of essays on the horror film that is pretty solid um but he has a few chap not a few chapters but he de dedicates like a section or two towards uh them and some other similar movies and uh I think he I don't necessarily know if I buy it exactly but he brings up some interesting points where he's he's kind of making an argument um that a lot of the ant stuff in this can maybe be read also as a metaphor um or an expression of anxiety concerning more the beginning of like American corporate consolidation. Right. I would be glad to hear the theory on that, but I, I, I have never read it that way personally. Well, here's the thing. It also refers back to what you were talking about earlier, where you made a comment about the 1950s being very conservative time. And one of the really neat things that Jankovic kind of starts to argue in his book is the idea that our idea of the fifties has been molded to the point where it's when you say the fifties were a conservative time, it sort of masks partially the reality of the situation um, where the fifties have become a conservative like repository for American nostalgia, but only in re retrospect. Whereas at the time, a lot of the policies and changes culturally in the country were very new right? And if you think about it, the 50s are the first time in America without some sort of like sustained, like devastating conflict since the 20s. You still have like the Korean War going on, right? And you have the looming threat of the Cold War. But it's like, you have 20s, right? 1929, market crash, then you're in the Great Depression, then you have World War Two, right? There's the events of like World War One, then the Great Depression, and then World War II specifically, the latter two more so for the U.S., are like a hard dividing line from one part of the century to the other. Right, Max? Yeah. So this world is kind of like very much unrecognizable for a lot of these people, I think, it, it, and in a way that does not feel conservative at all. And my point in just bringing that up is that, uh, and something that Jankovic mentions in his book, is that you know, academics at the time even uh, were not necessarily optimistic or sold on this American way of life that was becoming more and more normal. Um, the beginning of the consumer capitalist society that has completely taken over, right? And there are many ways in which you could argue that this type of American capitalist society that was being generated and solidified during this period of time in the 50s is something that operates in the machinery of a, an ant hive, right? At least as much as the, you might argue they would think the Soviet Union did at the time. Does that make sense? I, it does. Um, I can include some uh, quotes in the uh, show notes as well, um, but I think it's an interesting argument. And it, one of the other really neat things... It would be an interesting way to read this movie. I'm not sure if I entirely buy it, um, but... <laughs> I think it's somewhere in between. Um, but I also think like, it's just really neat the way he, he introduces the points about the way people thought about Russia at the time or Soviet union at the time as well. Um, where he talks about like, it's a whole, it's kind of like a manufacturing consent thing as well, where it's like, 
okay, so all these news stories and reports about Russia. Oh, uh, look how evil it is as a uh, rib human ribcage. So I guess it's been killing people for a while. They didn't know. Well, there's like huh. eight, eight people out in the desert, I guess. <laughs> it killed Courage, the cowardly dog. Look at that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and John Wayne. Um, but no, uh, what I was going to say is I, one of the really neat things he points out is how much um, ideas of the Soviet Union, even at the time in the U.S., were just more culturally constructed in the on the US's behalf like standpoint than actually in reference to a real what was really going on in the USSR right which totally makes sense so but his point in bringing that up is how like anxieties about the USSR because of that in many ways are perhaps more reflective of, of Americans own anxieties about their own society no understandable and yeah applicable yeah applicability doesn't necessarily mean allegory and like but like it, that's definitely a really interesting way to read it. Yeah. And just to relate that back to the, you know, opening sort of visual dichotomy that's created between this abstract, you know, natural open space and then the technology, right. That is represented by the airplane, by the cops, right. The institutionalization of that technology and those two things working together in this new post atomic world I feel like this movie more so than being a metaphor for like anxieties about the U S or Soviet union. It's more just generally about the anxieties of living in a world where technology and uh sort of, I don't know, the solidification of a new like global institutional structure is something that can be seen as both promising, but also, dangerous yeah and specifically with the science stuff i feel like i feel like the thing about the anxiety over science is the idea that i was trying to describe to you the other day and i don't know if i did a very good job but i think um a really neat way to to look at this is um this the introduction of amos vogel's fantastic book film and subversive art where he describes he, he makes a lot of like interesting connections, but one of the things he talks about is how like our modern understanding of science and physics changes the way we think of the world because we no longer can look at like this table in front of us and think of it as just a solid object. It's like, this is actually a bunch of atoms bound together and they're a bunch of infinitesimally small objects that technically are not touching each other, kind of, right? It's stuff our brains can barely fucking comprehend. Yeah, and it's the idea that we have reached a point in science that we have now like exploded everything to the point where it's like, we just, the more we learn, we just learn how little we know. Right. And that's a very big shift from the like 19th century. <laughs> right. Um, so I feel like that's one of the big anxieties here where we've reached a point with the, this technology where it's like, Oh, everything is totally weird and not the way we thought it was. And things we took for granted as being very simple are actually quite complicated. And uh, look what we can do with that information, Max. We can blow up entire cities. <laughs> so it's very dramatic, too, the consequences of it. And I think that also just relates to the fact that ants are the monsters. Because ants are so tiny. You see them in your backyard every day, right? But this movie is like, it's almost treating the desert as like America's backyard. It's like this thing that you thought was not a problem. Now science, partially what? responsible for it, but we look at it now and it's like, wait, there's actually weird things we didn't see here before and they can get out of control. Well, who did it kill? It traumatized that little girl, killed her parents and destroyed old man Jenkins in his shop. Yeah. And destroyed literally America. So, By the way, we've been talking over this and uh, I think I can speak for both of us when I say that it's just really fantastic that you get the scientists and the military men working together, right? And yet somehow they, they commit to doing the scientific solution to this problem, but still somehow that scientific solution is just shooting bazookas at it. The scientific solution is an episode of Mythbusters <laughs> of let's just dump cyanide gas inside there and then shoot bazookas at the opening repeatedly. Which also, weirdly enough, you know what else has cyanide? 
The Spectator Film Podcast. Well, Jesus, Max. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, you. No, it's a Pavlovian uh, response at this point. <laughs> oh man, you better be careful. Somebody might use that to like get your social security number or something. Uh, uh, no, um, no. I was gonna say uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon. Remember, they also throw cyanide capsules at it. That one, it's a little bit more comical because they're like, "How should we catch this monster?" And then it just cuts to them throwing cyanide like all throughout the ancient river that they found. You know, that we just bring with us. Where the ecosystem has been maintained and unchanged for like 150 million years. Yeah, let's just keep Let's just throw cyanide around. <laughs> so this is probably an opportunity to talk about another really neat detail that we, I think both of us kind of noticed for the first time watching it this time, which is the proliferation of like images of world war two combat throughout this movie where we've seen James Whitmore use the Tommy gun already. We got the bazooka. We have the standard American issue flamethrower. And yeah. And then we're, but it is the world war two looking yeah. flamethrower. And more importantly, they're going to use it in the way that they would be using it in World War II. They're going to use it in a giant trench, right? And they're going to smoke out these these ants. And uh, I don't know. I think it just struck us as interesting how, like, we're going to get this repetition of imagery from, again, an event that occurred less than 10 years prior. And I think it's imagery like that, Max, that I think really does hit home uh, some of the anxiety about, like, uh, you know, the potential of a World War Three related to, like, uncontrollable science stuff. You know, where it's like, you know, science is going to progress to the point where something's going to become really dangerous, and then we are going to have World War Three in our backyard, right? We are going to be in Arizona with our flamethrowers trying to fight something because, you know... What if just, like the entire desert region from like Texas to half of California just became like ant kingdom. And then we had to like start trading with ant kingdom. You mean like diplomacy with them? Yeah. That's the thing. We always tried to do that with the monster movies. We were always just like, Oh, let's fight him. What if we just like tried having diplomacy with ant kingdom? Because you know, what is really interesting about that, that I don't know what made me think about this, but this is kind of unrelated, but I was having a bunch of random thoughts about like um, the way like people view and dehumanize like non-white people and then also our relationship to animals and how those things are not necessarily separate from one another. Well, you're, it sounds like you were thinking about what was that uh, bright, that Will Smith movie on what? Netflix where it's like, Oh, the orc man. Yeah. All of the, all of uh, all racial minorities are now just Tolkien races for the most part. Which what the fuck? It's it's cringy. Yeah, that sounds terrible. When when Will Smith tells an orc to take his Shrek ass look yeah Shrek looking ass home and yeah go home to Fiona, I'm just like, wait, so Shrek exists in this universe? It's really forced. Is Shrek like a historical drama then? It, it's fucking. Wild as shit. Shakespeare's Shrek. Yeah, basically. <laughs> like, if orcs are a real thing that have been around for thousands of years, then Shrek is like a historical romance movie. <laughs> I'm just imagining like the alternate history. It's exactly the same stuff, but it's just like with orcs. An orc Mona Lisa. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds really stupid. Well, yeah. I wasn't talking about that, Max. I was more thinking about like... Well, that's what you get when your screenwriter is just the general piece of shit. Just just the utter worst. This was just me trying to answer your question. Where if there was an ant kingdom, we, I think, just out of sheer reflex, could never actually have diplomacy with a species that is not a, other humans. You know? Not, not like... Humanity would never accept diplomacy with a non-human species. Not even elves. Unless they came from the sky like angels. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. If if humans m like met intelligent ants, they could not treat them as intelligent. Because all other species are viewed as inferior because we have this weird like 
at least in America, there seems to be this very, very like hierarchical understanding of nature and the world. Right. And I do think it's, I don't know, it's, it's related to dehumanization of, of other marginalized communities as well. You know, But I don't know. I do think it's an interesting question. But here we get some very striking imagery again. And then, of course, the great cinematography from uh, from Mr. Hickox is going to come into play here, and it, it just looks great. Totally out of Aliens, of course. It's really remarkable how similar it really is. They they even get like the the shots of them shining the lights in it, and they get the movement inside. It's great. <sighs> this is now like this is like. The first half of the movie is just it's kind of just a roller coaster. It is. It's ge- well, it's like it's genuinely great horror and my only complaints about them is the fact that like the movie the roller coaster gets a little bit bumpy toward the end. It gets a little I think it would be nicer if it got more bumpy. <laughs> I think the problem is it's not bumpy. Yeah, it gets <laughs> it gets jumbled. It doesn't really know where it wants to go toward yeah. the end. So it just sits in a boardroom and talks about <laughs> it for a little bit. No, but then they go to like three different mental hospitals to talk to people yeah, about so stuff many they mental might have hospitals. Seen. And, and then Leonard Nimoy shows up and you're like, what? And then he just goes away. <laughs> no, you don't notice until somebody tells yeah, you. Yeah, because they're like, turn around, Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> don't even look at the camera. Well, and we're going to dub you over. Well, he's uncredited. He's not, yeah. he doesn't show up in the credits of this movie. And this is before anybody gave a shit about who Leonard Nimoy was. Yeah. So you're like, shut up guy who will never be a famous actor. Yeah. You and your shitty teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Look how angry James Whitmore looks. He looks like he's about to snap and just like murder everyone. He's probably drunk as shit. <laughs> <laughs> don't slander him. I don't think I'm slandering him. I'm pretty sure he had a drinking problem at some point, but. Based on what? Do you actually know that? I, I, Excuse me. Please no, Google that right now. I genuinely rem- like remember hearing that from one of the times I've. Right. Well, I can't judge. I'm going to have a drinking problem before too long, I'm sure, as well. well yeah. If you keep having to do this podcast with me yeah. and I make bold claims. <laughs> so another really interesting thing that we sort of um, talked over. Wait, what's During his name the, again? James sorry. Whitmore. James, not John. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we sort of talked over it during the bazooka scene, Max. And it was something we both sort of pointed out amusingly, uh, but then started to really think about when we watched it for the prep screening, is how the general was like flying the helicopter for them to get to the nest. And then he also helped them load the bazookas in a way that may, is like, it seems like he has some more important job to be doing. Yes, he's a general. <laughs> Uh, maybe we could get someone else to do this. I don't know. I don't know how the military hierarchy works, but I would assume the general is not the one firing the bazooka most of the time or flying the helicopter. Oh, I was completely wrong. I was thinking somebody else. Oh, there you go. My apologies to the late, great James Whitmore. Well, he's dead. It's too late. I just, <laughs> I already said that. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, in Washington, D.C. Yeah, it's about to get boring. But this is a good opportunity to continue what we were, we were just starting to talk about, which is um, the mixing up of hierarchies here. Uh, those of you watching the movie along with, with us will notice by this point that uh, James Whitmore, who was a local cop, is now in a suit at the Pentagon sitting with like fucking senators or whatever in this like <laughs> the government, the war room from Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> it's like, why is this local cop with these fucking people? Because that's how we introduced the movie and we forgot to write him out of the movie at any point. Well, I think it's also a a normal script would have killed him in that chamber and his death would have fueled FBI man and lady to keep going on. I mean, I don't know if it's quite like that. I I think the thing is more um, something that I also feel like Jankovic talks a little bit about in his book. Um is the idea, I think the term he uses is interactive community, where again, he is looking at this movie as something that's expressing a type of anxiety over increased like control and systemization of American life to the point of it becoming mechanical, much like an anhive, right? And his idea 
of looking at this movie as an interactive community is talking about how so many different characters in this movie sort of like act in a way that seems to be surpassing or subverting their station socially, right? Um, the cop really wouldn't be in this meeting in Washington. <laughs> he doesn't need to be there. There's no reason really. Uh, and, uh, maybe same with the scientists. Like, why are the scientists here? Maybe they would just send it, this information to them. Maybe it makes more sense for the scientists. Um, but we see this thing that happens where the movie sort of scales up and up and up, right? So it starts with this very specific single instance of the ant attack where we see that the girl is lost and then somebody's attacked the shack in the middle of the desert. Oh my God, right? Cops are investigating. Then we get the FBI and now it's more on a federal level, right? And then him and FBI guy are fighting with one another in a way that sort of introduces that trope into the cinema as well, I'm sure. And then we scale back even further and now we're meeting with the suits in Washington, D.C., watching this very Educational fun, ant video. <laughs> educational ant video. It's trying to make you... Do you remember... Did you ever watch Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? Yeah. I remember when the ant died in that... It's very sad. I, I remember. Fucking. You know, it's more sad than that stupid ass horse from Never Ending Story. Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, no, I mean, that's pretty sad, too. No, but I, I remember fucking wailing when the ant died. <laughs> Didn't I shrunk the kids? You know, it, in some ways, it's cooler to have an ant than a horse. <laughs> I'm not going to defend that opinion. I'm just going to leave Austin it there. Austin, quiet, boy! 2020. <laughs> Don't say my name. Max. Okay. Um, I'm going to have to bleep that out. Otherwise, people could find me. I mean, people can find me anyway. I just don't want to be held accountable for this. <laughs> I don't want to be held accountable for these terrible jokes. Yeah, it's just like in 10 years, somebody's going to be like, how dare you? <laughs> how dare you say stupid shit? <laughs> <laughs> having an ant is better than So a embarrassing. Uh, no. But uh, anyway, what I was going to say, continuing from what I was saying earlier, um, the idea of these different levels of the American community scaling and mixing with one another. And the idea that Jankovic is talking about is how this movie sees the solution to the threat represented by this, you know, systematized faceless society of the ants. Um, the solution is to overcome our own social conventions and restrictions, thereby asserting our own cooperativity. I guess it's like individuality through our ability to cooperate with one another past the conventions of our like social positions. Right. So we're overcoming the thing that defines the ants, which is their mechanical bug hive mind. Yeah. And that also has to do with letting a woman be there, but not in charge. Cause that's why the ants are going to only lose. a little bit in charge. Yeah. Cause the ants are going to lose cause they have a woman in charge. <laughs> That's the other thing people like to talk about as well. And that's something that we've talked about a lot. Jesus Christ, James Whitmore, please go on vacation. Why are you so angry looking all the time? Uh, no, that's something we've talked about, what you're talking about with the female queen, uh, with lots of horror movies, going back to stuff like Carol J. Clover um, or Barbara Creed with her book, The Monstrous Feminine. Um, the idea that horror is often othered as being feminine and uh, the monsters often has qualities that... Uh, are traditionally in media associated with femininity or othered in a repulsive and feminine way, often in horror movies also connected to the idea of birth um, and how that relates to femininity. And uh, another part of that too is that sort of women tend to be positioned in these types of stories as being like closer or more open to the supernatural or non-rational. Yeah. You've seen the wasp woman, right? Yeah. Have you ever seen the poster for that movie before? Oh, I kind of love the poster. Or with her just head on yeah, the wall. I remember watching that movie for the first time and just being like, fuck this movie. I wanted to see just a gigantic wasp body with a just woman's head on Roger it. Roger Corman for you. Has How, he made a coronavirus movie yet? Not yet. <laughs> It'll be done in five minutes. Let's hope he doesn't catch it. Uh. Oh, shut the fuck <laughs> up, Max. He must be protected at all costs. Thefts of sugar, syrups, and sweets. I love that. Oh, my God. What if we lost Mel Brooks? Oh, Don't you say that. I'm going I'm to have to, like... There oh, my is. God. It's Leonard Nimoy. Hello, Mr. Spock. 
thanks for showing up in our movie. I really appreciate it. Just... He even gets a speaking line. Look at him. And then just have him turn away from camera. Turn away from camera and we can't tell. Dub his voice. It sounds like he's being dubbed. But yeah, that's Leonard Nimoy just hanging out. Leonard Nimoy has such an interesting face and yeah. and voice. I guess it makes sense that you wouldn't want him to be too conspicuous. But also it's like you don't have to cast him as an extra. Well, this is yet again, this is before anybody gave a shit about Leonard Nimoy. So, yeah, I mean, it's not like the actors in this are like small fry. James no. Whitmore would I think he had one. I could be wrong, but I think he had one Oscar nomination by this point in time already. And then, of course, Edmund Gwen had won an Oscar. Right. These are kind of like big people doing the schlocky B movie. And then James Arness. Well, he's fucking tall, um, but also like. OK, Max, you wouldn't recognize him, but, do you know, he's in another really great cheesy B movie from this time. He plays a certain uh, intellectual carrot that I know we both love <sighs> in uh, the thing from another world. Oh, uh, yes. He's the carrot. <laughs> well, no, like, I'm sure this looked great on Leonard Nimoy's resume where you're just like, hey, I've acted alongside this. Oh, person yeah. Big hit point. movie. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Definitely. But yeah, just to finish up that point, referencing uh, Carol Clover and her great book on horror movies, Men, Women and Chainsaws, uh, which discusses gender a lot. And of course, uh, we should honestly Barbara Creed. just like send a link to the audio book for that at this point. Cause we, I don't know if there's an audio book, if but is. I mean, I, yeah, I have the show notes all like typed out Not, for all these different things. I've been thinking about making just a separate page on our website for that to be like, look, people, look I, can, at, I don't have yeah. to type it out anymore. Um, Not even that, but just cause like men, women and chainsaws is just like one of the stuff that especially you reference constantly. And I think yeah. That's great. Yeah. Well, it's, it just really hammers down a lot of patterns about how gender works in horror movies um, and just monster movies in general. And it is true that, you know, the, the female gendered characters in this movie are closer related to the monsters as well. Not only do we have the queen monster, even though like, I don't think it really asserts the feminine nature of the queen too much. Um, um, then it gives birth. actually, yeah, take that back entirely. Yeah. That's the whole threat of the Queens and why they have to track them down is like, cause the breeding is going out of control. That's very much an example of a type of like monstrous femininity. Um, even though I feel like it's also more specific than that. I feel like it almost, it uses that as, as, as like a justification, but it also, I get the impression it treats it even more abstract than that, where it's like the breeding is more of a like ability to self replicate infinitely. So it becomes kind of more abstract than breeding for me in this movie. Um, even though it is still definitely gendered as monstrous feminine. But as we can see in the earlier scene where we saw the ants for the first time, uh, the Pat character is the first one to see them, right? She's the one that has to lead the way because she's the one who knows about it, right? Uh, as we mentioned, her father, Edmund Gwend, is also an expert on ants, but he's not, he's not like his masculinity, his male identity is not constructed in the same way oh God. as the other men, right? Speaking of this part, when our nice authoritarian government starts to speed up and says, keep this man, yeah, perfectly sane man in prison, please. He is just too tall. <laughs> Look at this. This is just like not acceptable. They're, they're just like. You need to chill out, Austin. But I know. But like, look how the, go just, the government is telling him to keep him in the psych ward so that <laughs> he doesn't spread hysteria about giant ants that nobody believes him about already. Yeah. And then the doctor looks appropriately disturbed by this. Yeah, that moment is definitely like a precursor to the way bugs are treated in like Men in Black, which also we can still have the whole entire conversation of the idea of this movie being a type of like ideological propaganda. However, um, if you want to hear our opinions on Men in Black, go listen to that episode. Spoilers, yeah. we like this movie a lot better. Mm. Even though they're both kind of similar in terms of propaganda, although that one is Men in Black definitively is way more racist <laughs> than this movie. Um, however, uh, just to, again, to finish up that point about, you know, the gendered stuff, Edmund Gwen, his masculine identity is not constructed in the same patriarchal way as our other investigating male protagonists, right? He's kind of goofy. He's older. Um, 
And then, of course, the very first person who witnesses the ants we see is a little girl, right? And children are are sort of more gendered along the lines of being closer to feminine than masculine. They're just innocent. They don't yeah. have to deal with all of that shit. But again, if you're going to put that in a Venn diagram, that's going to be closer to traditional genderings of, of women, I think. Uh, I like this idea. And I get, for like practical reasons, why they couldn't do more with it. The montage stuff. By the way, can we just point out the really great thing we noticed right here? The guy's chewing gum. He's just, the sailor doing the Morse code is nonchalantly chewing gum. While all these ants are killing Well, people. no, I'm sa- I, I love the idea of, like, a nest landing, like, an ant landing at night on, like, this gigantic battleship. And yeah. And, like, the eggs hatching and, like, wreaking havoc. And I understand for budgetary reasons why we can't do that. But also, come on. I, I want just a couple more seconds of that. Yeah. Well, we need a couple more seconds of it because this stretch of the movie does, like you said, become... Just them going from boardroom meeting with just old fucking white people uh, to insane asylums. Yeah. And then just talking, you know, and we're just waiting for the ants to get here again. It's kind of like a victim of its own success, too, because after that great sequence where they go into the nest, you're like, I feel like it doesn't really set you up for like 20 minutes of (laughs) 20 minutes of boardroom meetings. Yeah. Yeah. We were just talking to like old men who like, seriously, all these men like don't care about anything. They just look like they're, they look bored. They look like they're ready for lunch. Yeah. They look like they're wearing suits on the top half of their body and they're just wearing their like robes on the lower half and they're like walking around in loafers. They're just like boring old men. None of them are like fun characters. And at the same time, I don't think it does enough to let like an actor like Emma Gwen or somebody take control of the scene in a really engaging way. It also doesn't have any fun explanational uh, or educational videos this time. So, Max, let's go back to the conversation of this and the idea of propaganda. And I think we can connect it to a number of different movies we've done already. We've already done a Godzilla movie, uh, but perhaps the closer comparison to talking about like propaganda and ideology and how it works in this movie is going to be something like Men in Black or probably the closest thing, Starship Troopers. I would I would agree with you with Starship Troopers. I think Men in Black is a different kind of propaganda. Yeah, Men in Black is more malicious feeling. Yeah, to me, and and Men in Black kind of felt like a betrayal to me. Like I never liked that movie too much right but like i kind of just considered it like well it is just like racist is just the thing i just considered it dumb stupid fun yeah when, from when i was growing up and re-watching i'm like oh this movie's gross it is gross yeah yeah it's really gross um and it just celebrates the policing and regulation of like uh, of like immigrant immigrant people but basically what you mean when you say like immigrants in this in the context of men in black is just non-normative people that's what it celebrates the regulation and surveillance of it's just it makes you want to take a shower um yeah men in black is definitely more malicious than this movie because even though this movie kind of plays as propaganda ideologically in the way that you know this community comes together to solve this problem i think it i i think it's just more sincere about that and also like we've sort of been talking about, it's more open to potentially, depending on how you read it, opening up a criticism of actual American society, which some a movie like Men in Black is not. The only criticism of American society that Men in Black has to offer is that like Ayn Randian criticism where it's like, these poor fools, without us, what would they do? They would just collapse and... We were here to watch these poor sheep. If they knew, if only they knew. Well, they couldn't know because if they did, they would start eating each other. Yeah, the poor, stupid people. That's the only thing Men in Black has to say, which is why it feels kind of weird and insane. And now we start developing into this. We've kicked one woman out of the movie, so now we can make room for a different one. What even is happening right now? Uh, the That's the guy who died when the ants attacked the sugar train. Oh. All aboard the sugar train, but... 
So they're trying to find this guy. You know what? That's what I'm going to do in my quarantine. I'm going to make a sugar daddy, sugar baby networking app called the Sugar Train. <laughs> Nobody take my ideas. <laughs> Listen, everyone. Trademarked now. <laughs> Spectator we, Film Podcast. It's too late. We did it. <laughs> in fact, you're all my sugar daddies. Donate to our Patreon. Yeah, follow. <laughs> <laughs> Go to us on Patreon. <laughs> $10 a month gets you the sugar daddy. Tier. Buy my food wish list so I can survive in the apocalypse of the coronavirus. Go on my only fans. <laughs> I'd like some wafers, please. I love how like, this is like the weirdest turn for me. Where like the way they're trying to track the ants now is like this woman's husband disappeared with the, her boys early yeah. on. It's so another like, neat thing that Jankovic sort of points out in talking about like the scaling of the different com- levels of the community where it sort of zooms out to the national level. Right. And then we, we've got two of the Queens, but we got to find the last one. So then it zooms back in again on the very local specific problem. And again, we're talking about it working as a type of propaganda movie because it buys into um, the system's ability to effectively combat these antagonists. And also you have these characters again, overcoming their social conventions and positions in the hierarchical structure to address the antagonism on different levels, right? So the general is still going to come to the aid of this mother, right? In a way that just does not make sense, kind of, when you really think about it. But the other reason I feel like this this is very easily comparable to something like Starship Troopers and uh, something that Starship Trooper ver- Troopers very intelligently comments upon in a subtle way is how the creation of just the fact of the monsters being ants and what that means prevents a type of identification with them that is very necessary in a movie that plays like propaganda. You know what I mean? Yeah, no. Bugs inherently just like... That's why you offer a lot of monsters. They'll have like bug like features and whatnot. Yeah. The carapace or the multiple legs or the weird eyes. Like it's why in propaganda and dehumanizing language, it takes on the language of describing animals and bugs most especially. Right. And you can find just real examples of this Nazi propaganda about Jewish people. Right. You're going to find tons of this. It's all dehumanizing language. Um, again, it's also why men in black is gross. The bad guy in that is a bug. I mean, yeah. And yeah. like all the aliens are just like bugs. They're none of them are mammal like, cause then we could sympathize with them more. They're all like weird, gross, slimy things that like we they're, they're othered. Yeah. yeah. And, um, there are different ways to sort of look at the idea of a bug, but I do think the emphasis on individuality is a big thing. Uh, we talked about this in our Pacific Rim commentary as well, which I we also talk about as being like more unintentionally like something that plays into like ideological propaganda um, for like a more like globalized capitalist society, authoritarian society in that movie. But the idea that this movie um, can very usefully be compared to Godzilla and the idea of kaiju versus monster. Right. And they're different things. We talk about this uh, in some of our other episodes, but they are definitely different things and individuality and the ability to actually relate and see yourself in your antagonist is a big part of that. Godzilla has a personality. And in the original Gojira movie, as you well know, Max, that movie is way more introspective than this one about the role that humans have played in allowing Godzilla to happen. Yeah, this this movie only sort of talks about that in the last couple of seconds where it's just like Oh, we irradiated them? Fuck. What what if this happens again? We'll we'll light them on fire. Yeah. And I do think that this movie, although it expresses anxieties about the fact that we irradiated these things, it is definitely something that is characteristic of the difference between the US and Japan at this point in time and how they relate to technology (laughs) because America, you know, the people making this movie seem to have a much greater faith in the ability of, uh, their own technology and the agency it gives them to actually address the problem (laughs) that it created. 
Whereas again, one of the funnier details about Gojira is the, the oxygen bomb that the guy creates. <laughs> the oxygen destroyer. Thank you very much. Oh my God. It destroys oxygen. Then, th- then that's not really like helpful. Fuck you. It destroys. <laughs> it works. It's deadly though. The point is that he creates something that is so monstrously deadly to fight something that is also monstrously deadly. And it's much more about the potential toll of not being able to responsibly interact with the world through modern technology, right? Godzilla is way more reflective about that. And in order to do that, you have to take more responsibility for it, which propaganda cannot do. Propaganda has to distance you from every part of the evil antagonist, which is why we've got ants in this one, and we've got a cool, awesome lizard in Godzilla. And also we can maybe compare it to um, some other older movies. One of the other fun facts about this movie is that uh, I think I think its production can be traced back to a re-release Warner Brothers did of King Kong in 1952, where I was reading this. And it looks like King Kong, when they released in 1952, made like, I think like $2 million, which was a decent hit for them at the time. It's around the yeah amount of money this movie made, so... Yeah, and um, a year later, they made a movie called uh, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, yes. which, if I remember correctly, does that also have a nuclear? That's like a dinosaur or something from like, I think that it's was, like trapped in ice. Yeah, no, that was like a woken by nuclear tests thing okay, rather yeah. than irradiated. But that movie was a really big hit as well. And then we get, now we're running, we're off to the races, right? So they make that movie 1953, and then they're producing this one in 1954. And as you have already mentioned, this is the second biggest hit this year. So now Warner Brothers, they're making these monster movies. And actually, I wrote down the list. There's like a torrent of them. Hold on a second. We go from this in 1954 to uh, Tarantula from 1955. A classic. The Deadly Mantis, 1957. Not as good, unfortunately. The Beginning of the End, which is the one with the locusts. Never saw that one. one. Then you've got, oh, this one's terrible. Uh, The Monster That Challenged the World. Oh, terrible. The Snail. Yeah. Listen, people, it sounds cheesy, but it's just... Bad. Stupid. Just look, I'm sure there's, like, footage of it on YouTube. Um, but yeah, that's the snail one. Then you got uh, the Black Scorpion in 1957, which okay. ain't bad. Then you got Earth versus the Spider in 1958. And, uh, nah. and then it, you know, it just goes on. But those are all just from like Warner Brothers. It's. Yeah, there are so many fun. I, I'm determined to find that shitty one where they just put like hoods on dogs and let them be the monsters. You really have to. But yeah, I think it's interesting that we can maybe trace the production of this movie to King Kong, a re-release of King Kong at this point in time, which absolutely King Kong is much more of a uh, kaiju monster. To a degree. Um, Why would you say not, though? He kind of is, but also, like, one, he's small compared to other kaiju. I don't think the size of it has as much to do with the fact that King Kong is a character. Yeah, so is Clifford the Big big Red Dog. Yeah, but he's not in monster movies. Not yet. Not yet. We'll see. Just wait until the extended universe. (laughs) But, again, King Kong is very much a movie where it's just, like, the audience and the viewers implicated in the destruction of King Kong in this very dramatic way. Um, And it wants to make you sort of more introspective, whereas it's sort of, it's clear that, you know, these 50s movies that were made in response to the success of the re-release of King Kong are much more focused on simply triumphing, triumphing over like something that's, if not objectively evil, something that's objectively antagonistic. I know they characterize the ants as like savage brutes, here, but really, I feel like we don't see enough of the ant behavior to really have that description that Edmund Gwen gives during the like lecture he gives to the you know uh, politicians. That doesn't really carry a lot of War weight. Gotten for me. hot. Yeah, really weird the way the guy delivers that line. 
But yeah, I think it's interesting that the description he gives of the ants being very um, warlike and savage doesn't kind of carry a lot of weight. Because they, yeah, they've been hanging out and they're just doing stuff. It treats them more like a natural disaster, you know? Yeah. They're not really quite antagonistic. They're kind of just like around. And then if you see them, they'll try to like bite you. And like how many people have died? Like eight? Yeah, it's not like they're after something or you've seen them interact with one another in a way that demonstrates their intelligence, you know? Which is part of the reason why I also, to go back to what I mentioned earlier, I feel like it's it's kind of more specific than them being gendered feminine because the only thing about it is the ability to duplicate and reproduce. And I do feel like there's a subtle difference between like duplication and reproduction. There's something about the ants that is kind of like asexual and mechanical that I think the movie is keying in on. Oh my God, he's announcing... He's announcing quarantine, Max. Yeah. They're very casual about the fact that <laughs> they're all quarantined because giant bugs are living in their sewers. And we have this couple who are about s- to fuck. Slightly less horny now that <laughs> they know there's ants on the loose. Yeah. This is weird. I feel like you could have like changed this up a little. I feel like we could have used this earlier. I know we were talking about the other day, like how would you really oh like, Oh my God, there's a black person in this movie. Holy shit. Non-white people exist in America. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah. The Sorry, only black just, person in that movie. It was a guy who was polishing a white person's shoes. Uh, oh, the 1950s. But yeah, we were talking about like how we could maybe like liven up the middle section of this movie. And I think a good way to have done it might have been to try to have more montage stuff like this where you see the results of them in the meetings. <laughs> like the meetings would be kind of easier to sit through if like they were like, all right, we're taking action. And then you see like people mobilizing, you know, you see the footage of people like at the airport, like waving helicopters to yeah. take off and then you know, jeeps are running around and then military people are like screaming and running into sewers. And it makes it feel like you're building to something more. Where I I really feel like, you know, these these two sequences where they now enter the like LA River tunnels, sewers, and uh, the sequence earlier where they're just in the giant ant tunnels are really fantastic set pieces. But I feel like they're just kind of like, there's like a discontinuity between them, which kind of keeps the movie from being entirely successful. There we go. That's what I was thinking of. What? The Killer Shrews. That's the movie I was thinking of. Nineteen. The Killer Shrews? Yes. Oh my God. Yeah, there, there is a Killer Shrews movie. It's, it's so bad. It is the worst. They just put some bad masks on dogs. I remember watching that during my like horror movie project year. And um, I think the version of it I watched was like 640 P or something. So I don't know if I even noticed that. <laughs> I don't remember anything about it. Oh yeah, that's right. I remember the long teeth. <laughs> yeah, that is just a dog. That is Wow. Oh god, the majority of that movie is really fucking bad, but like the scenes where they just sort of let dogs into the room and like pretend they're attacking people are great. This part's the most unrealistic, the fact that they would stop all military operations for the chance that they might be able to save two boys. Well, they're boy scouts. So they're in the military. But don't, like, military people die trying to save them. Max, I think you really need to just relax. <laughs> what are you, a pinko? <laughs> <laughs> you fucking pink. Actually, Max, you've, you bringing up the killer shrews, you've hit upon an interesting question. What does for make for, like, a good, like, irradiated monster 
in this type of movie and a bad one. Like, why is one like why is Night of the Lepus ridiculous compared to this? Uh, well, one. I mean, this is made better than Night of the Lepus. Uh, predators. They need to be predators. I think. Um, but do you know that? like rabbits who are crazy could not just like fuck you up. No, I don't. They could, but I don't have an instinctual, like, uh, I need, like, I don't have like that in the primal part of my being. Well, yeah. Okay. Let's zero in on this. So what, what do we think separates that? Is it ideological? I don't think it's ideological. I think it's just like, it's a feral thing. It's just like somewhere deep down from when I was either an ape or when I was like, a fucking mouse or whatever. From when you were a goth. Yeah. <laughs> you mean now? But, um, <laughs> from like somewhere down my evolutionary path, like embedded in my DNA, there's a thing like, okay, I don't like these things because it's a, ba- it's like bad for my safety to be near them. Right. So from like an insect that's bigger than me to the point where it can harm me, that's a no. Like a mammal that has a bunch of sharp teeth and like a growly face, that's a no. But like a rabbit that in like at no point in my evolutionary chain has that ever been a threat to me. So it's just like, oh, it's a bunny. That's cute. I don't know. It, I, I think that like that's just my opinion that like there has to be some way it could have been a threat or it has to be so alien that there's no way I can relate to it in any way. Bunnies are cute. That's the OK. This is the other thing I'm thinking of, which is why, again, I think it also... I could be wrong, but I think it also could relate to gender where it's like going back to the, to the insects, the insects are really the perfect other. And I think it does have to do with the fact that even though we can talk about the queen being in charge and laying at eggs and everything, they do kind of seem to have this implied type of like asexual reproduction, which for humans is just like not relatable. The idea of reproducing asexually, yeah. like that's not an experience that humans or like born in like go through. Right. I can't just like separate myself into two, uh, like an amoeba. Um, but uh, something like a rabbit does. Right. And even on that very simple level, you are now relating to the rabbit much more so than an ant. Right. No, 100%. Sorry. It's the end of the movie. I keep getting sidetracked, but like I said, I love this movie repeatedly. I'm trying to find the exact line where one thing goes from being silly and the other thing is serious. Is it birds? Have Would there, you be scared of irradiated chickens coming after you? I don't think so. I don't think there's ever been a scary bird in a movie. Like, I guess like... The birds? No. The birds, even when I was young, did not scare me. Um, you didn't get scared when that guy had got his eyes pecked out? No, actually. Um, and that was Hitchcock was an exception because my parents were like, oh, it's Hitchcock. So you're allowed to watch that. But, um, I don't know. Birds can be scary. I, I've never been scared by birds. I don't know. Well, um, you, we've still got that cassowary challenge <laughs> up for the Patreon, $50 right? on Patreon. Dude, no, it's got to be way higher. How did, <laughs> what is the fucking running joke of you like selling your life for like 25 cents? <laughs> You're like, I'm going to get stabbed to death by cassowary because I'm going to like barge in on their territory like the Kool-Aid man wearing like salami taped to my face. And then they're just going to stab you to death with their feet. Listen, and then we're going to get 25 cents. If our patrons want. <laughs> this is this is a one-time thing. It's not. Well, yeah, I'm going to be stabbed to death. It's not really something I can do more than once now, is it? Oh, man. Don't ask, Max. Uh, I'll find a way. Now we're following fucking Hubert and Dinkles over here trying to get these two boys back. This scene is very much reminiscent of Alien as well. Yeah, crawling through a small shaft trying to mm-hmm. save the children. It's like, really impressive to me the degree to which this movie... Um, it's really impressive to me the degree that James Cameron ripped off this movie. <laughs> well, make. this is in just Alien as well. And it's not even just specific to that franchise of movies. People crawling through things with monsters nearby is now a thing that's occurred in many movies. I know. Um, but it's interesting to me the degree to which this movie has seems to have kind of like partially invented and then pioneered 
that rhetoric. Um, and one thing we haven't really talked about quite as much is the way in which this movie is often discussed as a genre hybrid between sci-fi and horror. And uh, I've talked about it on other episodes as well, but I have a very specific kind of like a thought on how to like categorize things in terms of genre where I feel like the best answer is to really kind of, you don't even necessarily have to look at the text itself, but you look at the paratext. So in the case of movies, that would be how it's marketed. How does the marketing and the packaging of the movie, the items that are paratextual to the actual film itself, the things that surround it, what do they tell you it is? Because that stuff is trying to be organized in a way that can be uh, consumed in a way that I, I find generally more informative and than helpful than just like going over the like arbitrary, you know, genre lines. Like what does it matter if this is more a sci-fi movie or more a horror movie? Yeah. Right. But if you look at the marketing, that might tell you a little bit more about it. Um, but if we are going to play that game of, of trying to guess which one it is more based on just what's going on in the movie, do you think you have an answer? Um, I think it definitely starts off much more horror. Yeah. Um, I would say it's definitely a hor- more horror film for half of it. Um, the boardroom stuff is not horror. No, <laughs> it's horrifyingly boring. Oh, but but it is sci-fi. From this time, that's like very much from I like I haven't seen like yeah. You it, know, then, the it then turns into in sci-fi while, but, slash action. Yeah, um, but it's horror. It's more horror than anything. I would say, it's horror for more of its runtime than any of the other genres. Yeah. No, and, I I agree with that. And this part where it's just like they're almost eating the kids and whatnot, like that goes back to being a little bit horror. And, yeah, and I feel like it kind of declares itself as such, even with the... I mean, look at the shadow play yeah. and everything. I think it declares itself as such um, right away, even with the opening title. I feel like the graphic red title is something that feels more of a provocative horror movie mood than, you know, something that I might associate with, like, sci-fi. Not to say that this movie isn't equally important within both of those, you know, genres. And the whole... And then he's going to get snipped. Oh, they got him. Oh, is that another Wilhelm screen? scream? I don't know. I think we missed several of them so far. I wish that, uh, you know, the, like the scream when like Goofy falls off stuff, the whoa, like that one. Um, you should replace all Wilhelm screams with the Goofy scream instead. Just that, that would improve it. I just want to hear the least appropriate scream sound effects that's really what i want i want something that just doesn't make sense at all well, and that's then, like um well that's one of my problems with uh the disney hunchback of notre dame in general but like because that movie, that movie has tonal problems you know, like go from like a priest singing about like how he wants to rape this woman and hellfire is going to consume him to like jason alexander making fart jokes Jason Alexander. Fucking George from uh, Seinfeld. Oh, I know. I'm just trying to. He's He was a gargoyle. Um, oh, because I'm like, he's the comic guy who yeah. voices a funny friend of the person. But like, it's not Mushu and it's not <laughs> the genie. Who is it? Oh, it's a gargoyle. <laughs> Ooh, this is great. I love this action stuff. This is the most ants we ever see is just the bodies piling and piling up on each other. Huh. Night of the Lepus also has a lot of like mine shaft stuff in it. That's interesting. Well, I'm assuming it's easier to like conceal your props and just like. Yeah. That's definitely why they trucked in all that sand to blow in their face. Yeah. Earlier. But it's just classic horror movie stuff, right? You you mask it the best way you can. And then you watch it now. It's like it just it wor- it works great, you know? I think we're going to get yet another Wilhelm scream from one of these dudes who bites the dust here. I would love for that to be a car alarm. (laughs) Just change your car alarm to be that sound. Oh, there it is. Yeah. But at like this point in the movie, you're just like, okay, we win. 
Oh, Lady Doctor is back. Yep, she's leading the way, Max. So one other thing to just add on to the conversation of sci-fi versus horror, though, is how I feel like this this theme we've sort of been picking up the entire film about this new post-nuclear scientific world, Max, is kind of like how even at the time it could be perceived as like a vaguely sci-fi-esque world, you know? Well, it must have seemed like that to them. Yeah. It's just like... What do you mean? We like the very building blocks of creation can be split in half to yeah. just create this most destructive force that alters like reality. Like it must have felt like they were living in just like impossible. Yeah. And you're telling me that those same things that go into a bomb, like in certain senses, like variations of the small, small infinitesimal little building blocks that build up, like even me and my skin, these same things can be made to explode. It's like very weird to think about. Um, it's like, well, God, you might as well tell me that ants somehow can get really big. Because right? why not at this point? I mean, if you don't know, like, why the fuck not, Max? Yeah. Why not? Have you seen the, like, fossils of, like, giant fireflies from, like, the Devonian age? Oh, yeah, the the dragonflies and whatnot, Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. it's like they would eat, like, cats and everything. <laughs> Um, a dragonfly ate my cat. <laughs> oh my God. A dragonfly ate my homework. Is that the new excuse for all the kids these days in the post nuclear age? But I think it's interesting to look at that because it's like, uh, you have the horror elements almost being because they realize they now exist in the sci-fi world, you know, where it's like, Oh, anything could be possible, but that's also horrifying. And I feel like that relates to the way this movie sort of also pictures the the American frontier, you know, like um, or at least that open desert space where it is. It's more just like about the distance from civilization and technology makes you incredibly vulnerable there. All the imagery in those desert spaces is, is incredibly bleak. We were talking about during the prep screening how maybe you could even just look at it and you'd be like, wow, they may as well be on a different planet right now. Right. So it's very different from ideas, previous ideas of like the open American West where it's like free range, right. Where you can go find agency and it's like land for you to conquer. It's like, no, now this, this open space is now just like kind of a nightmare where anything can come for us. Yeah. With ants on fire. Yeah. So yeah, that's been them, Max. What'd what you a- think? <sighs> still great it's still what a wonderful movie i i don't there are there have been times on the podcast where i regret choosing movies that i genuinely like just because it's like i want to watch the movie i don't want to provide critical analysis austin stop it (laughs) i just want to enjoy this but like this is one where like there's enough highs where i'm like yeah this is great Uh, there are enough like sort of lull points where i'm like okay cool let's talk about the movie now and provide analysis for the time period it came out and what it means for different genres and just all sorts of fun things. So I two thumbs up and I would still recommend it to literally almost anyone to this day. But yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think I would agree. I, I think, I think it's, uh, it's almost vic- like we said at the beginning, it's kind of like victimized by how successful it is at doing different things and how much of an impact it had, because there are a lot of cool details in it. Some great cinematography, some neat set pieces, uh, that make it feel more vibrant and creative than it might might otherwise be. And of course, like we were saying, it's still topical. All these same issues. How's the community going to come together to resolve this weird, uh, intruding issue that's suddenly spreading across the, the entire country? How are we going to come together to solve it? Will we be able to come together and solve it? Will our technological prowess allow us to overcome this issue? Will the incompetent bureaucrats in the boardroom stop doing nothing and just light the ants on with a flamethrower? Now, Max, here's the other thing to mention about this movie that I discovered while researching it. 
which is uh, quite interesting, and I just wanted to mention this detail. And that's that uh, this was originally envisioned as a Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin comedy, which, what the fuck is that? I have never heard that in all of my researching for that. But That's what I found, which, you know, that might be neat. I don't know. I'm not, like, the biggest fan of Jerry Lewis, but, uh, you know, that honestly, sounds just weird enough. Honestly, like... For the first half of this movie, I would hate that, but right. it would really speed up the second half of it. And it also might make me remember any of the characters' names. Right. But so if I you just wanna, wanted to mention that detail. Yeah. But if you want to remember our names, it's uh, Max and Austin here at the Spectator Film Podcast. You can listen to more of our episodes on iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. You can check us out on spectatorfilmpodcast.com or check out our letterboxed. Um, oh, you remembered the letterbox. I was going to add it. At the end. Fuck. Well, Austin, is there anything else you'd like to add at the end? Uh, no, not really. Stay inside. Stay inside. Fucking practice social distancing. Don't go out unless you absolutely need to. Stay inside and read about the benefits of socialism. That's really what we need right now. Uh, turn off your TV. Stop listening to all these insane people. Uh, we need you to be prepared. Uh, because it's going to become a really crazy place when these aliens show up. Yeah.